I'm Jennifer Waters, the director of the Nikon Imaging Center at Harvard Medical School and a Chan Zuckerberg Initiative Imaging Scientist. This microcourse is the first in a series covering important aspects of fluorescence filters. You're watching part one, choosing an optimal filter set for imaging a fluorophore. Part two will cover special considerations necessary when choosing filter sets for imaging more than one fluorophore. And part three will discuss problems that can arise with filter sets. To understand how to best choose filters, it's useful to understand how fluorophores work. Our eyes see wavelength as color. As the wavelength of light increases, the amount of energy in a photon of light decreases. This diagram shows the fluorescence reaction. We begin with the electrons in the fluorophore in an unexcited ground state. We illuminate the fluorophore with light, and a photon collides with the fluorophore. If that photon has the right amount of energy, it can cause an electron to move into an excited singlet state. While in this excited state, the fluorophore loses a bit of vibrational energy as heat. The electron then drops back down to the ground state and releases the remaining energy as a photon of light. The energy of the excitation photon was higher than that of the emission photon, so the excitation and emission of fluorophores have different wavelengths. This is a super fast reaction. Emission of a photon occurs within nanoseconds of excitation. So in standard fluorescence applications, we simultaneously excite fluorophores and collect the emission using fluorescence filters. We often refer simply to the color of the fluorophore we're using and the color of the light that excites that fluorophore. But fluorophores absorb light and emit light to varying amounts across the spectrum. Fluorophore spectra report the amount of light across wavelength that the fluorophore can absorb and the longer wavelengths that are emitted by the fluorophore. Fluorophore spectra are different for each individual fluorophore. In this microcourse, I will use this spectra as an example. Fluorophore spectra are critical tools for choosing the best filters for imaging. Let's begin by thinking about what we need from filters in order to image the fluorescence reaction. Our goal is to excite the fluorophores in our sample and to collect their emission. Let's first consider the excitation of fluorophores. Fluorophores absorb different wavelengths of light to varying degrees. On a fluorescent spectra, the height of the curve represents the amount of that wavelength of light that we can expect the fluorophore to absorb. I like to think of this as a probability curve. In this example, we can see that the fluorophore can absorb violet photons, but it has a much higher probability of absorbing blue photons. To efficiently excite the fluorophore, we want to illuminate the fluorophore with the wavelengths of light at the peak. Now let's think about collecting emission light from the fluorophore. The fluorophore emits photons across the spectrum. To obtain the brightest possible image, we want to collect as much of the emission light as possible, being sure to collect the peak emission wavelength, since most of the photons emitted by the fluorophore are going to be at or close to this peak. We're going to select for excitation and emission wavelengths using filters. Filters are optical elements that are designed to block some wavelengths while transmitting others. The blocking and transmission properties of filters can be visualized on spectra that report the amount of light the filter transmits at different wavelengths. We also use certain terminology to describe a filter. The center wavelength tells us where along the spectrum the filter transmits and the bandwidth at half maximal transmission tells us the range of wavelengths that the filter transmits. These numbers are written as center wavelength slash bandwidth, such that in a method section, we might say that in this example, we used a 400 slash 50 nanometer band pass filter. So let's say we want to image a cell to which we've added a fluorophore. To image this sample on the microscope, we're going to start off in the dark, and then illuminate the sample with the wavelengths of light that excite the fluorophore. To increase the chance that a photon will collide with individual fluorophores, we have to use a lot of illumination light. The intensity of the illumination light is much higher than the intensity of the emitted light from the fluorophore. So if we were to look directly at the sample while we illuminate, 
and excite the fluorophores. The excitation light would completely drown out the relatively puny amounts of light that your sample emits. So we need to use a filter that blocks out the excitation light while allowing the emission light to pass through. This filter is referred to as the emission filter, also known as a barrier filter. To excite a fluorophore and collect the emission light, we most often use a set of three optical elements, which we call the filter set. The filter set is made up of two filters, including the emission filter, and one beam splitter. The optical elements in the filter set should be chosen such that they simultaneously allow for maximum excitation of the fluorophore, removal of excitation light from the image, and collection of as much fluorophore emission as possible. To understand how filter sets are used to image fluorophores, let's begin by looking at where these filters are placed in the microscope. Light coming from the light source enters the fluorescence filter turret. The fluorescence filter turret can hold multiple filter sets, with each filter set optimized for a particular type of fluorophore. Let's zoom in on a filter set to see how it works. The sample sits on the microscope stage. In fluorescence microscopy, we most often use epi illumination, which means that the objective lens is used to both focus the excitation light onto the sample and collect the emission light from the sample. Again, the filter set is made up of three optical elements. Light coming from the light source hits the excitation filter. The excitation filter is going to allow through a range of wavelengths that we're going to use to excite our sample. This excitation light then hits the dichroic beam splitter. The dichroic beam splitter reflects the excitation wavelengths of light through the objective lens to the sample. The sample absorbs the light and emits longer wavelengths of light, which, if collected by the objective lens, will pass through the microscope to the dichroic beam splitter. The dichroic beam splitter is designed to allow the longer emission wavelengths to pass through. The emission light then passes through the emission filter. Now let's get into the art and science of matching filters to fluorophores. All too often, people sit down at the microscope with their red fluorophore and choose the red filter set in the software, assuming all is well. This is bad practice. To get the most out of your fluorophore and to create the best possible images, you must carefully compare the properties of the fluorophore, the filter set, and the light source using their spectra. We'll start by considering the intensity of our light source across the spectrum. We sometimes use a white light source for fluorescence microscopy, which means that it gives off light across the spectrum. We use lots of different types of white light sources, such as LEDs or mercury arc lamps, and what I'm showing you here is just an example of what a white light source spectra might look like. These white light sources don't produce every wavelength of light, and they produce lots of some wavelengths and very little of others. Other times we use lasers for exciting fluorescence. Lasers are most often monochromatic, meaning they produce a single wavelength of light. We'll go back now to the fluorophore spectra and overlay the light source spectra on the same graph so we can consider the wavelengths of light produced by the light source that can be used to excite the fluorophore. We can now see that not every wavelength of light that the fluorophore can absorb is available from this light source, but the light source does produce the majority of the wavelengths of photons that we need to excite the fluorophore, so it'll do the job. Now let's proceed to considering the excitation filter. Recall that light from the light source will hit the excitation filter in the set, and we want to choose an excitation filter that'll allow through the wavelengths of light the fluorophore can absorb. Now we'll overlay the fluorophore spectra and the filter spectra. To get the absolute maximum excitation of the fluorophore, we could use an excitation filter that allows through all of the wavelengths of light the fluorophore can absorb. However, this is not ideal, which becomes clear when we consider the emission of the fluorophore. As is the case with most fluorophores, there's a small amount of overlap between the excitation and emission, and we need to be able to distinguish between the excitation light and the emission light. It's the dichroic beam splitter that splits the excitation light and the emission light. We want the dichroic beam splitter to reflect the excitation light 
while allowing the emission light to pass through. We need a dichroic beam splitter to cut right between our excitation and emission light. Here's an example of a transmission spectra for a good dichroic beam splitter for this fluorophore. It does not transmit and instead reflects the excitation wavelengths while allowing the longer emission wavelengths through. Adding back the excitation filter allows us to see why this combination won't work. The excitation filter transmits light that the dichroic mirror also transmits. This is a better excitation filter because it allows through only the wavelengths of light that are reflected by the dichroic mirror. Now let's consider the emission light. The dichroic mirror allows the majority of the emission light to pass through. In principle, we could stop here, but it's best to add one more filter, an emission filter. The emission filter should select for the emission wavelengths of light that we expect from the fluorophore. Emission filters play a critical role in blocking autofluorescence, emission from other fluorophores, and stray excitation light. Let's look closely at a filter set so I can show you what I mean by stray light. The dichroic beam splitter is meant to reflect the excitation light, but these beam splitters aren't perfect, and they do allow some of the excitation photons to squeak through. The emission filter blocks these stray photons from reaching the camera or your eyes, resulting in lower background and higher contrast images. Let's review what we've learned. An excitation filter should be chosen that transmits the peak excitation wavelengths. A dichroic beam splitter should be chosen that reflects the excitation and transmits the emission. An emission filter should be chosen that transmits the peak emission light. Filter sets are usually named after the fluorophore they were designed to image, but similarly named fluorophores can vary in their spectral properties, so you must check the spectra. Carefully choosing a filter set is so important. If you use this filter set to image this fluorophore, you'll look into the microscope and see green. But what if your filter set happens to have a different emission filter, like this one? When you look into the microscope, you'll see green, assuming your sample is bright enough, but you won't know that you've blocked out the vast majority of photons emitted from your sample. And if your sample is on the dim side, you might see nothing at all. Tragic. And remember, we use monochromatic detectors such as cameras and photomultiplier tubes. These detectors report the amount of photons, but they cannot report the wavelength of photons. At the microscope, we rely 100% on fluorescence filters to achieve the molecular specificity that we expect from fluorescence microscopy. So how can you go about finding this information for your microscope? First, look at the power supply box for your light source and get the make and model. Then figure out what filter set you have in your microscope. To get this information, you can look at the original microscope quote or invoice. You can take apart the filter set holder if you know how to do that. And if not, you can ask your commercial rep for help. Then head over to fbbase.org microscopes. On this website, you can build your microscope. For each optical configuration you use, you can input the light source and the filter sets and generate a spectra viewer for your microscope that you can save or even embed in your lab website. FPBase contains a database of fluorophore spectra that you can choose from to compare to your microscope, light source, and filters. If you don't find what you're looking for in FPBase, you can add it to the database yourself or make a request using the website contact form. I hope this was helpful. Please always choose your filter set carefully.